Cyprus in its early days uh, in three languages. Cyril also was a great naturalist. Uh, he was part of a generation in which you didn't have to have a PhD to know more about plants and animals and insects than most people with a PhD. Uh, he was out of that 19th century tradition of, of natural history. But he was more than that. He was a dreamer about what should human society have as its laws, the laws for nature. And Cyril de Clam worked with Francois Borhene Guillemin, the head of this environmental law center that was established in Bonn, Germany, with Dr. Wolfgang Borhene, uh, the first chair and founder of the Commission on Environmental Law. They developed this idea that we have to begin to develop new legal instruments. It was through them that uh, the concepts behind the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species were formulated, uh, World Charter for Nature, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly uh, as Resolution 37-7, the first time the UN had adopted a declaration uh, on what are the principles that should govern nature. Uh, and then ultimately, his ideas uh, were put into the development of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. So it's an example where experts uh, and, and thinkers about law, creative thinkers about law, had a vehicle to uh, refine their thinking uh, and present it to decision makers. In the case of national legislation, IUCN presented many proposals for national legislation, and it didn't just give them. Sometimes it took years to get them uh, educated, uh, the parliamentarians and others. But it worked on the implementation. It wasn't like a consultancy. It wasn't just giving advice. It was a partner organization working with governments to establish environmental legislation. And in 1992, uh, at the Stockholm Conference, not only was the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity submitted, uh, but the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development with the principles uh, that should guide us, including Principle 17, the principle on the environmental impact assessment, uh, the principle uh, for the precautionary principle, Principle 7 on the integrity of nature. All of these principles were put forward uh, and, and adopted by unanimous consensus in Rio in 92 and then again by the General Assembly and proclaim. By, 19, uh, by 2002, however, we began to see states pulling back. Uh, uh, 2002 was one uh, decade after Rio, and you did not have in Johannesburg, where the World Summit on Sustainable Development was convened, you didn't have such a clear consensus. The states were disappointed that the Agenda 21 recommendations of 1992 had been so slow to get implemented. And so they adopted the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation, which said, go and work harder at this. In fact, it was through IUCN that in the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation, one of the major omissions from the Agenda 21 was uh, redressed. Uh, through Professor Rottinger and others, IUCN had said, you must have a policy on fossil fuels, on coal, on um, oil, on uh, natural gas, and, and you can't have, you must have a set of principles that deal with how do we cope with the carbon uh, released by burning fossil fuels. And so for the first time in 2002, in Johannesburg, the declaration and the, print, the uh, uh, plan of implementation has several paragraphs on an alternative vision for energy. And that alternative vision for energy uh, supplemented an omission in Agenda 21, where energy was not addressed by Agenda 21, even though at the same year, the uh, uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in Rio de Janeiro. The interesting thing also about that uh, 2002 event was that IUCN was represented in those negotiations by a diplomat from Colombia, <laughs> the former environment minister, Juan Meyer. Juan Meyer had been uh, pushing very hard as the minister of the environment of Colombia, South America. He had been pushing for the development of uh, a stronger commitment to ethics and stewardship 
in uh, the implementation of Agenda 21. And in every one of the preparatory meetings uh, going into uh, Johannesburg, he inserted a line in the beginning of the uh, Johannesburg Plan of Implementation, very simple sentence. He said, ethics is fundamental to sustainable development. And after each preparatory committee, somehow, through the intervention perhaps of certain states, these words were eliminated from the draft. And he came back to the next preparatory committee meeting and he was incensed. He said, how can this be? You've dropped out what we put in. And he would put it back in and all the states would agree. And the next time it was disappearing again. So when it got to Johannesburg, unfortunately, uh, Juan Meyer, who was an active member of our commission, even while he was the minister, had his, he had lost his office. He was no longer the minister of the environment. It was a change in government in Colombia. And it was my privilege as the chairman of the Commission on Environmental Law to see that he was uh, designated as the representative of IUCN to attend the, uh, this uh, negotiation. And of course, he had been in all the other meetings, so he knew all the other diplomats. But this time, instead of representing a sovereign state, representing IUCN, he was able to have the words, ethics are fundamental to sustainable development, inserted into the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation. And that is where they are today. IUCN, therefore, has been able to consistently maintain these ideas. It was, in fact, in the 1960s, through a study by IUCN, that the word sustainable development was created. IUCN fashioned that concept. It, it adapted it beyond the sustainable yield of nature, uh, an old idea. And, and then it was picked up in 1987 by the World uh, Commission on Environment and Development, the Brundtland Commission, in their report, Our Common Future. And they took Jim McNeil, who drafted it, took the concepts of, of sustainable development and put them into our common future. And then, of course, the whole world began to read about it. And that then became the basis for uh, the, the Earth Summit. So IUCN had, and its legal and policy uh, initiatives have had a major impact on the development of environment law around the world. Unfortunately, we've had in 2008 the breakdown of the international financial system. The use of credit, the abuse of credit, uh, the inability to provide honest and conservative financial transactions uh, in lending money for housing mortgages and then repackaging the loans as if they were valuable assets uh, has brought the economy of the United States and the economy of the European Union literally to its knees. Uh, I'm ever so grateful for the central bank in Europe for what it did this week in once again bailing out the banks because it is keeping uh, the economic system uh, literally on life support until it can begin to recover again. When it recovers, we have to rethink our financial system and our economic system. And one of the challenges that the Law Commission will take away from this time in the next four years is how to rethink the role of financial institutions. Justice Antonio Benjamin, who is the incoming chair of the Commission on Environmental Law, a judge of the uh, Supreme Court of Brazil, has already indicated that he wishes to work closely with the international financial institutions to rethink the role of nature in their work. And we heard this morning from Rachel Kite in the opening session uh, from the World Bank uh, that she would welcome that kind of initiative. And so we're going to see a, a, a new dimension of the work of the Law Commission in the next four years to rethink how traditional finance must literally uh, take into account nature and the fact that all finance depends on human society and that depends on nature. Now the work of the Law Commission has continued to grow over the years. I don't have time to go into it in great detail, but the initiatives that IUCN undertakes are not done in four years. They're not even done in 10 years. Uh, it took us from 1981 to 1992 to uh, achieve the negotiation and acceptance of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And then it has taken all the years since 
to help implement and refine the legal principles. And now we must go back to many na national uh, uh, parliaments and begin to renegotiate their national laws for implementing biodiversity systems. Because we have many obsolete laws at the na at this nation state level which don't reflect the innovations of international law. And these national laws, in fact, retard and restrict the implementation of international environmental law. What are the themes that will be uh, pursued, uh, that we will have to pursue as we adapt to this new world of, of climate change? Well, one that came out of the negotiations in uh, Rio de Janeiro last June in the Rio Plus 20 meeting is the concept of the non-regression principle. Uh, we, we must not allow the repeal of the environmental laws that now exist, whether we want to repeal them because of the financial crisis of the recession or for any other reason. Instead, we must refine and enhance the role of environmental protection. And the analogy here uh, is that is coming from the concept of human rights. Just because you cannot implement human rights doesn't mean you should repeal the laws, uh, the uh, covenant on human rights in the Declaration. Instead, we must see how to better apply those and learn uh, how to better apply those. Another legal principle which I think we will have to magnify in the next few years uh, is one you all know very well, but we take it for granted. And that is the principle of cooperation. The principle of cooperation is fundamental to the uh, Charter of the United Nations. It's the basic international law principle on which the UN system is based. But it's deeper than that. The principle of cooperation goes back into ancient uh, uh, human experience. Uh, Confucius, in his Analects, was asked, what is the fundamental concept which people should follow? And Confucius said, uh, is not reciprocity that concept. And we have it in our religions, in the golden rule, and the concept of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This concept of empathy and cooperation with other human beings for our mutual benefit must be magnified in the coming years. And we must put that into the work of the Environmental Law Commission and, and take this concept which we have in comparative law. We have the Va de Voisinage, the law of good neighborly relations, in German, not correct. We have this concept uh, as, as just a standard thing we always think we should do. But during adaptation to climate change, during the great tragedies which we will now discuss in the next uh, panel, the, the resolution that the, that the Korean Environmental Law Association has put forward, uh, after an event like Fukushima, we must all cooperate. We must work together to repair the damage and rebuild a more stable society. So the law of cooperation, I think, is going to take on a new dimension and a new meaning. And the work of the IUCN and its Commission on Environmental Law will help us understand that humans must cooperate with nature and be part of nature. And as the ecologist Aldo Leopold said, the land ethic must mean that we embrace the community of life, the entire community of life, not just human life, but the life of all living uh, entities, because we are that community of life on Earth. That is the vision that IUCN created in 1948, and every generation since has been elaborating and, and cultivating that tradition. And it's an extraordinary honor to have the Korean Environmental Law Association taking the leadership in pushing this idea further, uh, and it's a great privilege to have been invited to share with you uh, and this history of IUCN and how the topic which the Korean Environmental Law Association will now introduce is really part of this tremendous movement of, of human uh, well-being which began with IUCN's founding in 1948. I thank the interpreters for the <coughs> translation into Korean and I thank you all for your kind attention. Oh, more than expected. Now, our attention should be drawn to the first 
Professor So, the guy recently introduced the professor Robinson to you. And professor So is a very famous professor in the Bush field of the law, environmental law, and the international law. Personally, Professor So is one of my idols and always impressed me in many ways. Actually, he always intimidated me. Uh, to be honest, and I'm requested to play a moderator of this workshop by the professor. Uh, I'm very nervous because I have no experience to be a moderator, even in the domestic workshop. So, but Koreans have uh, some the customary rule that the younger brother always abide by the elder brother's order. This is a natural thing. I think that, but this time this is for me, it's a natural disaster for me. Yeah? <laughs> so, I'm a truly a victim of the man-made disaster made by the professor. So, I would like to have the chance to pay back in the near future. Uh, please welcome Professor Sir uh, from the uh, Aju University School of Law, and he has a um, director of the club. Please welcome Professor with a big hand. And the all audience is 
more than expert view. So yes, absolutely sure. The Professor Robinson is here. So well, it's very difficult. So I just forget this one and I like to go this way. Everybody know the natural disaster, earthquake, the tsunami, the storms, landslide, flood, volcanic eruption, etc. We call act of God in, in terms of legal way. It's no responsibility. But the part of the natural disaster has come from the act of human. For example, the global warming, our artificial, uh, the acting, like uh, uh, emitting the greenhouse gases, sort of dioxide, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it bring back as a natural disaster, global warming. Well, okay, so what shall we do? We have another session for the climate change. I like to point, uh, put the priority on uh, how can we do a natural disaster itself. Two way, prevention. The other one is post management of the natural disaster, reduce the environmental damages. And the key one is how can we work together as professor